Just like the, like the rapid help. That's fine. Thank you very much, Mike, for the very kind introduction. Uh, I'd, I'm very honored to receive the Ira Herskovitz Award. Um, I actually met Ira for the first time when I was a PhD student at Stanford in the late 1990s, and I've greatly appreciated his work, and, uh, um, and it's a pleasure really to get it. I want to thank uh, Mike and the community for re receiving this award. I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, for getting it, and maybe we can have the slides come up for me. Yes. There's a lot of people to thank. I think the first person that I want to thank really is Ron Davis. So as Mike said, I did my PhD with Ron. Uh, Ron is an incredibly creative individual, uh, developing novel, innovative technologies, and I think what he really did uh, extremely well is to let his people free and, and to let them pursue ideas, uh, provide them with uh, lots of resources, cutting-edge technologies, and and so it's really a pleasure now to, uh, to have returned to Stanford and to co-direct the Genome Center with Ron. Um, and so I hope that um, we have many more years to, uh, leading this center together, and it's really a pleasure to share uh, a building uh, with Ron and to run into him and discuss science. The other individual that I really want to thank and I share a building with is Mike Snyder. Um, so Mike is the chair of, of the genetics department that I'm in, and. Uh, He's also an individual who develops cutting-edge creative uh, scientific methods and technologies, and at the same time is able to do all kinds of other things, like lead a department, run a lab with uh, 100 people, and attend meetings and organize meetings and be at almost every single meeting that I attend. Um, and in addition to that, he also has a lot of fun, and, and uh, this is actually a picture from the last uh, East meeting in Seattle, and Charlie is there too, trying to convince us to uh, take a trip uh, into the desert of Nevada and uh, live life like hippies. Uh, so fun times associated uh, with this too. I often get asked what it's like to run a lab uh, across two continents and um, this has really been great uh, for the science that we've done. Um, it really has catalyzed our productivity. Uh, for one, it allows science to really proceed around the clock. So when the one uh, set of people shift off, the other set of people shift on to work. And if you write a manuscript, you can send it over to the other side and you'll get a revised version the next morning when you come into work. Um, so it's really fantastic. In addition to that, the two institutions, Stanford and Emble, really have complementary strengths. So strong uh, clinical applications, engineering at Stanford, uh, strong basic science at Emble. It allows technologies also to disseminate very quickly into the community, so new technologies that could be developed at Stanford, we can disseminate through the core facilities that EMBL has uh, in abundance uh, to the scientific community uh, throughout Europe. And for the students and postdocs, it's been great because they get a lot of international exposure. I run the lab as a single, as one lab. We have joint group meetings across the two sites uh, that we do, and, 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 uh, and individuals in the lab do uh, get to visit the other place on occasion. I've had really nice people, and it's really uh, to them, a credit to them, um, of the scientific achievements that we've made to date. We had an alumni retreat recently. This is a picture of some of the people that could make it to this retreat, but it's really a fantastic set of people uh, that I've had a pleasure uh, to work with. So I now want to switch over to science, uh, and I want to tell you a couple uh, stories. Um, and I'll set the stage by telling you a few about the, the work that, that we've done in the past that led to some of the work that's still unpublished uh, and cover uh, three different areas uh, that we uh, do in the lab. And so we started, when I started my lab um, in 2003, we thought of the genome as a series of uh, genes that are spread around the genome, kind of like beads on a string. When we started to use unbiased methods to study transcriptional architecture, at that time using tiling arrays, now we do it by sequencing, we found that most of the genomes actually transcribed. In yeast and rich growth conditions, it's already 80%, and if you uh, scan a number of other conditions, I believe that every single base in the genome will be transcribed in at least one condition. A lot of that transcription arises from the action of bidirectional promoters. So contrary to classical view, I think every promoter fires bidirectionally in the genome, and that can generate uh, protein coding RNA in one orientation and a non-coding RNA uh, in the opposite orientation. Uh, and when that, those non-coding RNAs lie antisense to protein coding genes, they can be involved in gene regulation, and in particular when they overlap the promoter region of these genes as we heard in a talk earlier in this meeting, they suppress uh, transcriptional initiation of the gene on the opposite strand. Not only is every base in the genome transcribed into RNA, but every 
region is also transcribed into the form of different isoforms that differ in their start and stop sites of transcription. Uh, and that can actually uh, diversify the proteome when uh, open reading frames are only partially transcribed. And in those cases, you'll get initiation of translation on the downstream methionine, and that can make the difference between including or excluding a signal peptide that's attached to the protein. So you can make multiple versions of enzymes, for example, extracellular or cytoplasmic, like in the case of SUC2. But there could also be new proteins, short proteins, encoded in some of these RNAs that we so far uh, classify as non-coding RNAs. And so one of the findings from this plethora of non-coding RNAs that are coming from bidirectional promoters is really this idea that genes are not arranged randomly in the genome and that there is some interlinked regulation between neighboring genes. Um, so you could have a bidirectional promoter, for example, driving a protein coding a gene in one direction. In this case, it's gal In the opposite direction, there's a non-coding RNA that's being uh, initiated that overlaps an upstream gene. So if you regulate this promoter, we could show that you're actually also regulating not only this uh, protein coding RNA, but also the upstream gene. And you can turn that upstream gene on and off by the regulation through the GAL4 binding site uh, due to the action of the non-coding RNA. And we got these observations from genome-wide analyses. So there's tons of other genes like this that are in the genome where uh, there's interlinked regulation between neighboring genes, and you can have cascades of even more complex regulation that spans multiple neighboring genes through uh, interlinked regulation. We've also recently looked, took a closer look at functional RNAs inside cells, and polyadenylated RNAs are typically thought to be functional RNAs, um, but they can differ in terms of their five prime ends. So when they're capped, they're these classical mRNAs. But there's also a large abundance of polyadenylated RNA that has only a monophosphate five prime end. So it doesn't have a cap structure. And these monophosphate five prime ends are the result of exonucleotide cleavage, for example, by uh, XRN1 in the cytoplasm. So they're degradation uh, products. And uh, what we could see is that that's actually quite abundant. 12% of all poly uh, ARNA has a monophosphate 5' end. And if we looked at the pattern of where these 5' ends fall, when we sequence all of them across the genome, we find that we're getting uh, the resemblance of a three nucleotide periodicity in the open reading frame that actually reflects the position of translating ribosomes. So that suggests that RNA degradation and translation co-occur at the same time and that you can read something out about the dynamics of translation by simply sequencing monophosphate 5 prime RNA. And it's an extremely easy protocol. It's even simpler than standard RNA sequencing. So you can apply that on any RNA that you've stored away uh, and get complementary data to ribosomal profiling. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, when we really started to look at uh, RNAs across the genome, we um, realized that every position in the genome is actually transcribed in the form of different isoforms. And classically, you couldn't really address this question with tiling array technology or with standard RNA sequencing, because with those methods, you typically fragment RNA or cDNA into small fragments. So if you see a signal at two positions in the genome, like here and here, you wouldn't know uh, after the fact whether that came from one and the same RNA molecule, um, because you lose that connectivity. Um, so we had developed an approach that we named TIFF sequencing, where we sequence the ends of one and the same RNA by generating a full-length cDNA in a poly-A and cap-dependent fashion, and we circularize that cDNA to bring the ends together. And we isolate just the junction fragments and then use paired end sequencing on an Illumina machine to come in from both ends and thereby get nucleotide resolution 5 prime end and 3 prime end from one and the same RNA. And you can do that on a bulk RNA that you've isolated out of cells. Um, and so we could generate maps of transcript isoform heterogeneity across the genome. We've done this uh, in yeast. We've also done it in, in other organisms. And uh, we can see similar complexities. Here's just one example. On the top is the Watson strand. On the bottom, the Crick strand. In the center are annotated protein coding elements. And every single line here indicates one transcript isoform that we detected that overlaps these regions. So you can see lots of variation. You can see bisestronic RNAs, for example, here, where two open reading frames are spanned by one and the same transcript. The second one is also independently transcribed overlapping RNA messages here, and then lots of variation in terms of the UTRs and even initiation inside the protein coding region 
that then uh, can be initiated for translation on a downstream methionine, generating a truncated uh, protein message. We did this in glucose and galactose growth conditions and, are, and were really surprised by the large amount of transcript isoforms that we detected. We found 1.8 million unique isoforms for this genome that has 6,000 protein coding genes. And um, if you just conservatively look at just the full-length protein coding RNAs, it's on average 26 isoforms per protein coding gene in this genome. So there's lots of variation. And it's not just that you have one major isoform and lots of minor variants, but you have to consider at least 10 isoforms to explain 80% of the expression of a gene in this genome. So lots of these isoforms typically have not been looked at, and, uh, but are contributing a large proportion to the expression strength of genes in this genome. And I think one implication of that uh, is on cell-to-cell -cell variability. And um, so I think that some of these variants uh, can be contributing to diversifying cells in a clonal population. So they have the same genome, but they're reading that genome slightly differently, generating distinct isoforms. And we knew from previous data that uh, there's an average of about one mRNA molecule per gene per cell. I'll show you some data in a second that actually suggests that number is slightly higher, but even if it's a few RNAs, uh, then if you're sampling across 26 per protein coding gene across the entire genome, it's likely no two cells are the same in terms of the transcriptome that they're generating. And that can mean that if a clonal population of yeast cells sees an unforeseen environmental change, maybe one cell will be in a state that will be able to survive that, that perturbation, pass on the genome, and regenerate that heterogeneity. So we wanted to test that um, by doing, starting to do single cell transcriptome experiments and when we uh, started that, it wasn't possible to do this in yeast because there are too few RNAs that you can isolate out of a cell, but you can do that in mammalian cells with about 300,000 mRNAs per individual cell. And so we did a study, for example, in embryonic stem cells and could show that when a single cell expresses multiple copies of a gene, it tends to make the same isoform over and over again. But in, in another cell, will pick a different isoform and generate that, suggesting that this could be somehow programmed into the epigenome or perhaps even into the, into the chromatin that leads to that state being inherited. And similarly, in, in uh, the mammalian thymus, we could see extensive heterogeneity between individual cells. So we've just recently gotten single cell transcriptomics to work in yeast. And this is a project that's very much still ongoing, and I'll just show you some uh, preliminary data that we've generated so far. So we've, we're here generating transcriptome libraries using unique molecular identifiers that we add into the uh, reverse transcription reaction so that every unique RNA molecule will be tagged with a unique molecular barcode. Uh, and that enables you, when you do dramatic amplifications by PCR, to distinguish PCR amplification products from unique reverse transcription events. And that then allows you to count the RNA molecules that you get out of a, out of a single cell. So we've done about 600 single haploid yeast cells so far uh, using this technology, sequencing at a depth of about uh, 1 million uh, reads per individual cell. And um, we found uh, that we could detect about 40,000 uh, RNA molecules per individual cell. Um, there's a distribution. Some cells give us more RNAs, others give us less, but on average it's about 40,000. And one of the main problems with doing single cell transcriptomics is actually that the reverse transcription has limited efficiency. Typically it's somewhere between 5 to 20 percent of the RNAs are captured and yield a reverse transcription product. So the vast majority of the RNA you're isolating from a cell you don't even see because it ne never ends up in a, in a sequencing library product. Um, and so we estimate the efficiency of that reaction by spiking an RNA at known concentrations. These are these ERCC spikins. And of those, uh, we see that we recover about 20% on our library. So we're estimating our efficiency at about 20%, but since we're detecting 40,000, that would mean there are about 200,000 RNA molecules per individual yeast cell, which is high, a couple fold higher than uh, previous estimations. And so uh, we're still not sure whether that's the final answer but we've done extensive controls to make sure we're really dealing with single cells and we're still um, generating experiments with orthogonal methods to test that. One of the things we started to look at is whether the patterns that we see on bulk data actually replicate at the single cell level. So one of the th phenomena we've investigated in more detail is bidirectional promoters, asking 
if you see a transcript coming off in both directions from a bidirectional promoter, then from bulk data, that could either mean that these transcripts are showing up in the same cell or that 50% of the cells in the population are making one transcript and the other 50 are making the divergent one. So with single cell data, you can look at that and we actually see that there's a significant uh, enrichment for seeing both divergent transcripts within the uh, same cell. So it looks like these promoters are active in a single cell and firing transcription in both directions in the genome. So that's how, how far we've gotten so far with this particular project and I want to now tell you about another ongoing project that uses uh, the power of yeast genomics uh, to look at natural products. And so this is a, pr a project that we have ongoing at the, at the Genome Center. We're now in, in year two of this particular project and the idea is to, to generate and identify new natural products uh, from strains that cannot be cultivated in the laboratory um, but where you can make yeast a super host uh, and a producer of these natural products. So you can uh, actually, this is a large uh, class in general. Natural products make up about two-thirds of all drugs that are currently on market. Um, and so a lot of these organisms that are making natural products, over 90% of those are not cultivatable in the laboratory. So from genome sequence data we can go in, we can try to look for the enzymes that encode these particular natural products and then resynthesize them, put them into SRVC and see whether we can detect a new uh, natural uh, product. And so this is a project that is funded by NIGMS. And they've actually launched uh, an, an entire network with several teams. Uh, we focus uh, on yeast, but there are other teams that focus on bacterial natural products and other ones on plant natural products. We have a primary focus on polyketides as a subclass of these natural products. And so what is interesting is that these enzymes are clustered in the genome. Uh, and so you can identify these uh, putative clusters by uh, spatially localized predicted enzymes that are found uh, in these genomes. And, and so our pipeline currently um, uh, consists of, of different steps. We select the clusters from genome sequence databases. Uh, we then uh, recode them, leaving out the introns, and synthesize them um, from oligonucleotides, and then put them uh, into yeast uh, and then detect by mass spec whether they're producing a new uh, natural product uh, that we didn't see before uh, in these cells. And so our goal is to do this for 600 uh, gene clusters and uh, thus far we've, we've processed uh, 76 pathways uh, and have so far identified three novel compounds. The entire library now is set up, sorry, the pipeline is set up, so it takes about four months to take one enzyme cluster and process it uh, through this pipeline. So. Um, this is uh, work that's ongoing. Maureen Hillmeyer at the Genome Center is leading uh, this particular effort. So in the last couple minutes of my talk, I want to tell you about another technology that we're working on uh, at the Genome Center. This is uh, led by a postdoc in my lab, uh, and it's a close collaboration with Utken de Merci, who's an associate professor of radiology at Stanford. And uh, this project uh, tries to explore novel uh, phenomena of cells to try to use uh, novel mechanisms to detect cellular properties. And so magnetic levitation is one of the mechanisms that we've applied here. You can see here in this video a frog levitating in a very strong magnetic field. This experiment actually received the Inn Nobel Prize in 2000. Uh, Andre Geim, who did that experiment, went on to do better things. Uh, in 2010, he actually got a Nobel Prize for the discovery of graphene. Um, it was believed that you couldn't levitate any uh, living object smaller than 20 microns in size, and so single cells uh, couldn't be levitated, and we started to think about that problem and um, surmounted these challenges by putting cells in a paramagnetic fluid. So we use a standard MRI contrast reagent that each one of us gets injected if you get an MRI done. Um, cells are immersed in that fluid, and then they're put between two stationary magnets that are facing each other with the same po uh, pole, uh, towards the uh, space, about one millimeter by one millimeter here, where we can put the cells in. And then within minutes, kind of cells uh, find an equilibrium position. Gravity is pulling the cell down, and then a buoyancy force generated by the, uh, by the paramagnetic fluid and the magnets is pushing the cells up. And eventually they find an equilibrium position within, within minutes. Uh, and we can then read out the height at which they levitate above the bottom ma uh, magnet. And that corresponds very well to the cellular density that the cells have. 
We also think that there is an inherent magnetic signature in the cell that could influence this, but to our first approximation, it's primarily cellular density that drives uh, the levitation height. And so you can use this to isolate cells of different densities in a complex mixture. We've applied it here to look at red blood cells. You can see here the space between the two magnets, bottom magnet, top magnet. Initially, the cells are very distributed, but you can see here within minutes, as they're finding their equilibrium position, uh, the cells are eventually form a single band uh, in that field. And so you can use this to sort out red blood cells from white blood cells and even circulating tumor cells, which is an area that we're looking at right uh, uh, as of now. But I want to show you some data that we've generated with yeast with this technology. You can take cells in different cell cycle stages and put them into the mixture and, and naturally cells in different cell cycle stages will find a different position of equilibrium um, as during the cell cycle the density changes of these cells as they're budding uh, and separating. So in principle one could follow this further and see whether the technology could be used to uh, enrich cells of a particular cell cycle state. We've also used it in yeast to test immediate responses to drugs. And so in this case, we've taken antifungal drugs and exposed yeast cells to these drugs and then measured within minutes whether the levitation height changes. And so when cells die, they become denser. And so we can see it within minutes whether the cell is responding to the uh, antifungal agent. So you can see here B, we've used BY strain exposed to cantharidin. And this strain is actually resistant to cantharidin, so you don't see any changes in levitation height. But if you expose it to fluconazole, the strain is sensitive to that, and it becomes denser, as you can see here, and sinks down. And that corresponds very well with, uh, with OD measurements that you can do, or even with uh, dead stains that can be applied uh, to that mixture. The entire device is very small. It's very cheap. It costs less than $3 to manufacture this. And you can use a, an iPhone camera to, to image the cells between the magnetic uh, field. Um, and so uh, the technology is portable. And obviously, we're exploring different uses of it for also for uh, diagnostic purposes and for monitoring health uh, parameters. So with that, I want to finish and just summarize the topics that I told you about. We've been developing single cell transcriptomics methods to look at heterogeneity between individual cells. Uh, we're exploring uh, yeast as a super host for the production of natural products in order to tap into that diversity that's out there in nature that you cannot really get access to uh, because the organisms are non-cultivatable. And we're using magnetic levitation as a new technology to explore what we can do with that to sort out cells of different densities, but also to see how cells respond to environmental stressors. And with that, I finish. want to thank all the people in the lab. Uh, I already have them up on the individual slides. I really want to thank you again for the, for the award, and it's an honor to receive it. Thank you. Time for a couple questions. So I'm wondering to what extent the variability in the mRNA isoforms, it gets translated to variability in protein products? Yes. Yeah, very good question. So obviously, the, we have many more variants currently at the transcription level than we can validate at the protein level. So I cannot tell you what proportion that is. But you can see things like SUC2, uh, which is a well-known case where there is a variation at the protein level where we can see that variation in isoforms. And it switches between glucose and galactose conditions. So one isoform is preferred under one environment, and the other one, it flips over to the other isoform. And we have other examples like that. Variant question. Looking across the, the yeast, um, um, the fungal orthogroups, uh, is there evidence that, that pervasive transcription uh, gives birth to new genes? That noisy transcription gives birth to, or that the, some of these, this transcription non-coding regions might give birth to new genes. Just yeah, we, we haven't really done a lot of comparative analysis yet of transcriptomes from related species uh, to really address that question, but um, I would anticipate that that's true, yeah, but that data isn't there yet. With the PKSs, uh, you mentioned you found three new compounds, right. and presumably you rediscovered some known compounds. Yes. I was wondering how many right. of those there were, and what you could tell us about, on average, how does the yield uh, right. look in these early experiments? Right. So, so the so the network here and the program officer at NIH is really pushing us to go after unknown unknown clusters which are compounds where we don't really know that the clusters are really acting as uh, polyketide synthetases and where we don't have any idea about what natural product is producing. So we don't have a lot of statistics yet 
on how we perform if we take clusters you know, that are already making known products. So those are, those are new uh, compounds that we detect. And we, you know, they're mass spec um, peaks, so we're, uh, we're trying to uh, generate these in larger quantities and then, uh, and then eventually we're interested in functionally characterizing those. But the focus really of the, of the grant is to, is to detect a new compound and functional characterization will be covered separately. If you grow a cl separate cl clones from individual cells, do the sets within a, a clone, are they more similar in odd pattern than, than separate ones? Yeah, we're doing those experiments right now. So we, we take cells and we encapsulate them in, a, in an alginate bead. Uh, and then you can let that, those cells divide for certain sets of generations. And we're currently characterizing the population heterogeneity that's being generated and to try to see kind of at which stage, you know, you would get regeneration of heterogeneity that you can see on a population level or to what extent it's inherited. So I, I don't know the answer to that yet, but that's, that's running. Great. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Lars. Sure.